Um, now we want to talk about how microprocessors talk to other devices. Of course, microprocessors need to use some of its pins to uh, communicate with other devices. There are essentially um, two ways, well, a couple of ways to uh, perform this kind of communication. Um, what we want to look at here is, first one is the port-based I.O. or parallel I.O. Um, the way the microprocessor communicates with the outside other devices, um, it uses one or more uh, n-bit ports. The reason we say this ports uh, specifically is because usually these ports are named ports. P0, P1, port A, port B. So there's a name assigned for these ports. And the way you um, send information out um, through these ports is by using the name of this port. So the microprocessor will manipulate on this port like it uh, does on a register. So you send information out and read the information in through this named port. Um, there are many examples, uh, P0, for example, um, P1. Um, also, for the PIC microcontroller, you know, you're dealing with port A, port B, um, these ports. The second type is uh, what's called a bus-based I.O. So the processor has different buses, address, data, the control, uh, and these buses are used together to communicate with the outside devices. And the communication protocol is built into the processor. Using Intel um, architecture as an example, if you remember what we uh, learned from microprocessor one, um, we look at the Intel x86 processors. Um, they have address bus, data bus, and control bus, set up control signals. When the processor performs a read operation, uh, let's say um, it reads a, a byte from certain I.O. address. So what happens is when the microprocessor tries to execute this instruction, the address that you want to access will be put onto the address bus. And if it is a read operation, then the corresponding control signals will be asserted or deasserted by the processor. It's not, by, it's not done by your program explicitly. No, right? When you write your assembly language program, let's say you are reading a byte from an I.O. address 8000. You just give this instruction. All the um, low-level communication protocol was done by the microprocessor, including sending the address value to the address bus, asserting or deasserting this read control, I.O. memory, those control signals. Those are done by the microprocessor itself. That's why we say a single instruction carries out read or write protocol on the bus. Um, there are some compromises or extensions. Uh, for example, uh, parallel I.O. peripheral. Uh, this is when the microprocessor only supports bus-based I.O., but uh, parallel I.O. is needed. By that, we mean we will want to uh, access certain ports. For example, in this figure, port A, B, and C. Those are parallel ports. So each port may have 8-bit or 16-bit. Uh, we can um, use a parallel I.O. peripheral to communicate with these individual ports um, in parallel. But still, we can put this parallel I.O. peripheral onto our system bus so that we can use an address to access this parallel I.O. peripheral. But in fact, this controller will be able to talk to um, individual ports. Sorry. 
We can also extend this type of operation um, for port-based I.O. Now you can see that this processor talks to um, other mm -hmm. devices in different way from the, this processor, right? It uses port-based I.O. It does not have address. It does not have address to the other devices. In this case, if we want to extend uh, these I.O. operations into multiple ports, we can use a similar um, unit to connect these port A, B, and C to this controller, and then we use port 3 to access this controller, which in turn access um, the other three ports. We talked about these memory map I.O. and the standard I.O. or isolated I.O. Um, in the last class. Um, this two ways of memory mapping um, is very typical in modern microprocessors uh, with its uh, subsystems. Memory mapped I.O., um, which means that we're going to map the I.O. device as part of the address memory space. So we reserve a region, and that region is going to be dedicated to the device we want to access. By device, we mean the I.O. device. Now, we want to uh, make sure that we understand at this point we have memory, which is a major subsystem of the computing system, and also we have those so-called I.O. devices, which is different from the memory subsystem. The second way to do this mapping is the so-called standard I.O., or sometimes called isolated I.O. In this case, the I.O. devices will be residing in a separate address space. Uh, once again, by address space, we mean a region with addresses starting from zero to whatever its uh, <laughs> maximum upper range. There are pros and cons for these two different um, I.O. organization. For memory mapped I.O., it requires no special instructions. The way you access memory is the same as you access the I.O. device. Um, you can use um, these memory addressing mode to so specify an address. Uh, remember the brackets, right? If uh, you recall the x86 assembly language instructions, if you have a bracket, that means that's a memory operand and depends on what's uh, within the pair of brackets, you can calculate the address, and that address will be used to um, locate the either the data in the memory or the data in the I.O. device. For the second type of organization, the standard I.O., um, there are special instructions to access these I.O. devices. Uh, using, again, the x86 ex as example, in and out, these are the instructions used to access I.O. devices. For the standard I.O. case, there's no loss of memory address to peripherals. The complete memory address space uh, is available for memory components. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, using the standard I.O., the address decoding is simpler because you know exactly when you're going to access I.O., when you're going to access um, memory. Now, what we want to show here is a very basic memory protocol. Uh, we use this 8051, uh, it's a one type of microcontroller, as example. Um, we first, this 8051 is a port based I.O. type of uh, microcontroller. Uh, by that we mean it does not have a address bus. Okay? If you look at these um, output signals from the microcontroller, there's no address. Okay? It has P0, um, P2, uh, and some control signals this ALE is address latch enable, and we have read and write control signals. 
Now, note that this P0 and P2, those are 8-bit port. So when you want to output the value from P0 in your program, you're going to uh, say um, P0 equals to a value, right? So you're going to assign the value to P0, and this value will be uh, put onto this 8 pins out of this um, 8051 microcontroller. Um, in this example, what we intend to achieve is to use this 8051 to access um, two pieces of memory, external memory. Now, the part of the memory subsystem, as you can see, um, this one, this is a memory chip. The memory chip has address bits, right? It has control bits, and in this example, this is a SRAM, so it has uh, output enable, write enable, also it has chip select. The address bits for this chip is 16-bit. In order to access this memory chip, access the content, you need to provide a 16-bit address. Okay? And of course, the corresponding control signals. Similarly, for accessing this chip, uh, which has a slightly smaller size, uh, it has 15 bits. Now, so we're facing this problem. On one hand, we do not have address bus coming out of the microcontroller. On the other hand, these memory chips require address bits to access the content. And by the way, in order to access the content in the address chip, uh, in, in the memory chip, you have to have valid, stable address signal maintained for a certain time. We call that a memory access time. You cannot just say, hey, give you the address, and within uh, several uh, microseconds. If the address signal is not valid or not stable, then the access to memory chip will be uh, corrupted. So the solution here um, is to use a latch. Uh, this is a 74373. It's a 8-bit um, latch. This IC uh, is used to retrain the value um, for a certain amount of time. And look at the way we connect this latch to the microcontroller and to the memory subsystem. Um, on the input side, we connect the latch to P0. And on the output side, we connect the output to the address bus to the memory chips. And in particular, we connect the um, output Q to the lower 8 bits. And we connect the output from P2 to the memory, um, to the upper 8 bits of the uh, memory address. Now, how do I know which one is connected lower, which one connected to the upper half of the address? I know that by looking at this timing diagram. The timing diagram shows you P0, P2, an output from the latch, and ALE, that's the control signal, and recontrol. So what we see here is when I want to access the content of the um, memory chip, I will split the 16-bit address into two halves. Lower 8 bits are going to be put into P0, Higher 8 bits are going to be put into P2. 
and then the ALE, the address latch enable, will be asserted. And if you look at this schematic, this is the control signal to the latch. So when this is asserted, the input on the D side of the latch will be uh, carried through the chip and put onto the output side. And it's going to stay there. So as a result, the lower 8 bits of the address going to appear and maintain on the output of the latch. So at this point, we have lower bits, lower 8 bits of the address, and we have the higher 8 bits of the address on P2. So we now have all the 16 bits that are required to access the content in the memory. And then this read control signal will be asserted. Uh, and this read control is asserted. And I think this there's some um, mixed up here. This read should be connected to the output enable. Write should be connected to write enable. So this is a, a very simple example that shows how we can use core-based I.O. from a microcontroller to access a memory subsystem, which requires addresses. And this following one is a more complex memory protocol, which I will not discuss uh, this time. In the next series of slides, uh, I will look at, I will introduce the interrupts, which is a very important uh, mechanism used in modern computer systems. First, let's answer the question, why do we need an interrupt? Suppose you have a peripheral that uh, intermittently receives data. So the data comes in once a while, there's no streaming data coming in. So you don't know when the data comes in. And when the data comes in, this data has to be received, processed by the processor. One way, a naive way to do this uh, type of operation is to program the microcontroller or microprocessor to pull the peripheral regularly to see if data has arrived. By regularly, often time we mean constantly. So you can program the microcontroller in a tight for loop to keep checking, hey, do I have data from that peripheral? If no, okay, um, I'll do it later, check later again. So you have a tight for loop, keep checking, keep checking. And that's a waste of uh, CPU cycles. You can program the CPU uh, to do uh, some other things. Um, very much more efficient than just keep pulling the peripheral device, which do not receive data regularly. So that's the reason we um, use this interrupt mechanism. Interrupt means that the peripheral will try to notify the microprocessor using special signal hardware level signal um, so that the processor can respond to the newly arrived data. Um, this is a hardware mechanism, so we require extra pin or pins. And often the time, um, it's a one pin, the name is INT. So if the INT is asserted by the peripheral device, that means the peripheral device has indeed received new data, so the processor needs to um, suspend what it's doing currently, then switch to process this new data. And once the processing of this data is done, then you can resume uh, the execution of the earlier program. And this is where we um, have this concept, interrupt service routine. This is a special program that the micro 
processor uh, needs to execute when it sees an interrupt happen. This type of I.O. operation is called uh, interrupt-driven I.O. Essentially, interrupt is actually used hardware uh, resource, special dedicated hardware resource to do the polling. Instead of using software instructions to do the polling. Because the bottom line is when the interrupt the pin is asserted, when it becomes a one from uh, zero, the hardware built into the processor should able to detect that and cause the microprocessor, the main execution path to um, branch to the interrupt service routine. So we know that there is an interrupt service routine. It's a piece of code. It contains some instructions. But where is this interrupt service routine? So that's the second question we want to answer. What is the address or so-called interrupt address vector of ISR? There are essentially three ways to determine um, what is the address of the ISR? Uh, they are listed here. The first is fixed interrupt. Uh, in this case, the address is built into the microprocessor, cannot be changed. Now, can you tell an example that used this type of interrupt vector? The pick you're using, right? The pick you're using, uh, I should use this fixed interrupt. Address number four, that's the in interrupt vector. It's always there. It's always the same. So um, this fixed interrupt is uh, typically uh, present in simpler low-end microcontrollers. The second type is called vector interrupt. In this category, the peripheral must provide the address. So the peripheral not only raises the interrupt signal, it also needs to provide the address of the interrupt service routine. Uh, it's common when microprocessor has multiple peripherals connected by a system bus. The third one is a compromise between these two, uh, which uses interrupt address table. Let's look at the first one, interrupt driven I.O. using fixed ISR location. This picture shows you um, at high level what's going to happen uh, in this interrupt uh, handling procedure. Vertically, uh, from top to down, that's the time. Uh, and horizontally, um, this is the microprocessor. Okay? These are the steps will be performed by the microprocessor. And this second column here, these are the steps performed by the peripheral. Um, now, instead of reading this um, diagram, I want to show you um, through animation that what's going to happen uh, when an interrupt uh, occurs. In the very beginning, microprocessor is executing the main program. And this is the program memory. Okay, this is the main program. Uh, this is the, is the ISR. Okay, let, let's assume that um, the fixed address is 16. So 16, this is the first instruction uh, going to be executed by the microprocessor uh, when interrupt happens. And this is the, our peripheral, P1, uh, with the address 8000. And this is the register that may uh, have new data. 
it's connected to the interrupted pin of the microprocessor. So in the first step, the microprocessor is executing its main program. Let's assume that this microprocessor is trying to execute uh, instruction uh, 100. And peripheral one receives input data into the register with the address 8000. Second step is that because the arrival of new data, this peripheral will assert the interrupt pin. Typically, it's from zero to one. And because this interrupt pin is asserted, the microprocessor needs to respond. Okay, it will suspend the current uh, program, uh, will then um, try to execute it I saw. So the microprocessor, after completing the instruction at 100, which is the main program, it will, it sees the interrupt pin is asserted, it will save the PC's value of 100, and then set its PC to the ISR fixed location 16. So it will change the execution path to instruction 16 and continues from there. Now what ha happens here is that this um, microprocessor, this ISR program will read the value from this address 8000 and then do something. In this example, it modifies the data the write the result to address 8001. And because this microprocessor reads data from peripheral 1, this interrupt will be then deasserted because peripheral 1 knows there was a read operation, so that means the new data has been read, so I can deassert uh, the interrupt. And as part of the ISR, this new data will be modified and uh, written to this other location. After that, um, this ISR will return and the microprocessor will have the PC restore to the next instruction, which is 101. So the microprocessors uh, is going to continue uh, the main program starting this 101. So that was um, the procedure of handling a fixed location interrupt. But the vector interrupt is very similar, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, there will be New data arrival, peripheral raise the interrupt signal, main program branch out to ISR, uh, and then handle the interrupt. So the first several um, steps are very similar. The microprocessor is executing the main program, and uh, peripheral may receive a new data. It will assert the um, interrupt pin to indicate there is a new uh, data right. And after completing the instruction at 100, microcontroller will uh, save the PC value and assert this interrupt acknowledgement. Now, after interrupt acknowledgement is asserted, that's when the microprocessor tells the peripheral that I got it, I know you have an interrupt. Now the microprocessor expects to know something more about it, which is the address. Okay. 
So this is when the peripheral will send that address onto system bus. This is in fact the data bus. So the microcontroller or microprocessor will be able to receive that value and use that value as the address of the ISR. Okay, so this is a step uh, that's different from the fixed uh, location uh, interrupt, which there's no need of communicating such value because everything is fixed. Whereas in this case, the peripheral has the responsibility to tell the uh, microprocessor where is the ISR. So the next few steps are the same as uh, the first uh, scenario. The microprocessor will execute the instructions within ISR, do all these manipulation, and then this uh, uh, once this interrupt service routine is completed, the microprocessor will restore its PC to uh, the new instruction in the main program. The third category is the interrupt address table. It's a compromise between fixed and vectored interrupt. Um, in this case, it uses one interrupt pin It also uses a table uh, that residing in memory. This table serves as a translation table. So the peripheral will notify the microprocessor what is the type of the interrupt. So it will tell the microprocessor the value. And that value, also called index, will be used to find the actual address that's stored in that table. So we have um, an interrupt address table, and the value provided by the peripheral will be used as an index to find the actual address stored in that table. So this is so-called the interrupt address table of type of interrupt handling. So the benefits, you need fewer bits because compared to the vector-based, for the vector-based, you need to send the complete address. In our case, uh, in that example, 16 is a very small value, but you have to be able to address all the address space. So you need a very large value for the address. Whereas in this interrupt address table, you only need the index. For Intel IA architecture, the index bit is only 8-bit. For 8-bit, you can have 256 type of interrupts, and the actual address of the SRs are in the table, not uh, communicate from the peripheral uh, over the data bus. The other benefit is you can move the ISR location by just changing the value in the interrupt address table. Some additional interrupt issues, uh, we have uh, maskable interrupt and non-maskable interrupt. Uh, for maskable interrupt, you essentially can use a control bit to tell the microprocessor to respond or not respond external interrupts. But there are some interrupts um, that cannot be ignored. These are non-maskable interrupts. Um, typically, these are reserved for uh, drastic situations, like power failure. Uh, for jumping to SR, some processors uh, may treat uh, these interrupt service routine as a subroutine, so it will save a lot of uh, context. Uh, not only the PC, but also other registers. But some processors uh, don't. Uh, they only uh, 
say partial state like the PC. So you have to uh, check the data sheet to understand uh, what will be saved during a uh, branching to the ISR. Now we want to move on to a, another topic, direct memory address, or DMA. First, uh, we want to introduce the uh, term buffering. Buff buffering here in our context refers to the uh, action of temporarily storing data in memory location before processing. It happens in a case that when you have a lot more data to be processed and you want to store them in the memory uh, before you get lost, uh, before you losing them. Let's take a break. <coughs> okay, um, let's continue on the direct memory access. Buffering is an important concept um, in designing data processing applications. Um, often the time you need to store Often time you need to store data temporarily before you can actually process the data. Uh, this is because the data keeps coming in and your processing power is not able to pick up, uh, keep up with the speed, so you need to store the data temporarily and that's called buffering. Um, the microprocessor uh, could handle this with ISR. Um, by that we mean in order for the buffering to happen, you need to bring in data from the peripheral and store them into some region in the memory. You can of course have a interrupt service routine as we see from the previous slides. Um, then these service routines can grab the data from the peripheral and then move the data to the main memory. That's possible. Um, but in this case, and because we use interrupt service routine, um, the microprocessor is moving the data, in fact, rather than uh, carry out some other useful work. And this is the problem we want to solve using this new technique called direct memory access. In order to perform direct, direct memory access, we need a uh, hardware, and this hardware is called a uh, DMA controller. DMA controller is a separate single purpose processor. Uh, this single purpose processor will be responsible for transferring data from peripheral to the main memory. And because it is a separate, dedicated controller, the main processor, the main microcontroller, can still execute other programs. And this gives us a lot of um, benefits, um, very importantly, relieve the main CPU from this data moving, data movement. Data movement is now done by the DMA controller. As a result, the regular programs can be executed by the main processor um, as before. This is the high level picture of uh, what's gonna happen when the DMA um, occurs. Again, this vertical um, from top to bottom is the time progressing, and this column shows the action on the main processor, and this column shows the action on the peripheral. And we'll again look at the animation in the following slides to understand the operation. Now first, uh, we want to show that what's going to happen if we do not have a DMA controller. In this case, you know that the, for this data movement from peripheral to main memory, the main CPU 
should handle that. So the very beginning, the microprocessor is executing the main program. Peripheral receives data in a register. And it raises the interrupt. The main processor will save the PC to respond to the interrupt. And the peripheral will send the vector to the main processor so well, the main processor knows where is the interrupt service routine. Again, this is the same as we <coughs> showed you before. And the main processor um, jumps to the address, in this case 16, and start executing the interrupt um, service routine program. In this program, what you see here is this main processor actually uh, is going to perform the data movement. It will read data from the peripheral into the microprocessor. And that's this path. And then um, move the data from the main processor to the memory location. Now, if it is a single piece of data, that seems fine. But if you have many, many bytes to move, then you're going to consume a lot of CPU cycles. That's the situation where the DMA controller will help a lot. So the next steps are still the same as before. Uh, to complete the interrupt service routine, the microprocessor uh, resume the main program. This is the case where the DMA uh, is introduced to help the data movement. Now, from the high level, what you see here is quite different from um, the case we do not have a DMA. Now we have a new column here. This is the DMA controller. So from this picture, you should notice that we now have three um, players this is the main processor, this is the peripheral, and then we have this DMA controller. Okay. We have a new hardware, DMA controller, to handle the DMA. So let's look at this several steps. Uh, when the data arrives, the peripheral is going to raise an interrupt. In fact, this case, it's the um, interrupt or request to the DMA controller. Okay. Rather than directly to the microprocessor. This is to notify the DMA controller that I now have new data to be processed. The DMA controller will pass on this request to the microprocessor by raising this DMA request. Okay. This is similar uh, with the interrupt, but this is specifically this is the DMA request. This is different from interrupt. This DMA request is a way to ask permission from the microprocessor so that this DMA controller can take control over the system bus. Why does the DMA controller need to take control of the system bus? It, that's right. It needs to transfer data. The way to transfer data is to use the system bus. You can see that the memory is connected to the system bus. And more specifically, the memory has this um, address bus, data bus, and also a set of control signals. They're all part of the system bus. So in order for the DMA controller to transfer data from peripheral to the memory, it has to take control of the system bus. So this DMA request is to ask permission 
from the microprocessor to do this. From the microprocessor point of view, after executing the current instruction, the microprocessor sees this request. The MA request is asserted. It will release the system bus if it thinks that it doesn't need the system bus at this point. It is uh, differently from the previous uh, cases where we do not have a DMA controller. In this case, when the microprocessor decides to release the system bus, it will continue the execution of the main program. Okay. It microprocessor only stalls if the if need needs system bus again. For example, if the following instruction is a memory instruction. In that case, it has to access this memory, so it has to wait because it just released the system bus to the DMA controller. But if the following instructions are register instructions, it does not need to access memory or I.O. In that case, the microprocessor can continue the execution. We show here is the, DM, uh, the microprocessor uh, acknowledge the DMA request to release the system bus. And then the DMA controller will subsequently acknowledge the request from the peripheral. The next following cycles, the DMA controller will perform data movement. It will move the data from the peripheral to the system memory. Okay. Now there are some details, in fact many, many details here uh, in this movement. For example, um, how does the DMA controller knows where to put this data in the main memory? And how many of these bytes should be pushed from the peripheral to the main memory. So all these details has to be handled. Uh, due to the timeline, we will not discuss this in more detail, but I want to tell you that in order for the DMA to perform these operations correctly, the microprocessor needs to program these parameters ahead of time. And the actual address will be determined by the operating system. For example, uh, the OS has to reserve a specific region in this main memory for this DMA to happen safely. Because you cannot let the DMA controller to put data in a random place. You have a lot of important information as part of OS stored in this main memory. And often the time, you only reserve a specific region for this DMA to happen. Okay, those are the details uh, that will be programmed into this DMA controller ahead of time. Okay, finally, this uh, DMA completes. It will deassert the request, uh, and then uh, that is to tell the microprocessor that uh, the DMA operation is completed. In the next couple of slides, uh, we're going to briefly look at arbitration. Uh, this is when we have multiple devices request service from a single resource. For example, if you have multiple peripherals, and when interrupt happens, how do you determine which peripheral the microprocessor needs to respond first? So that's the priority issue. Uh, there are different ways to uh, do it, uh, all of them through some kind of priority arbiter. This is a high-level picture. Um, 
you have this main processor and these peripherals connected to the priority arbiter. The arbiter will be programmed by your program so that these peripherals take different priority. For example, if you have per peripheral one has <coughs> higher priority than peripheral two, then when both of them um, request service, priority um, peripheral one will get served first. And this is some of the details. For type of priority, uh, you can see there are fixed priority, also there are rotating priority. Um, depends on what kind of arbitrary you use, and you can program them differently. Also, you can do this daisy chain type of arbitration. Um, the further end of the peripheral on this daisy chain will get lower priority. There are different pros and cons. Um, for this daisy chain arbitration. Network oriented arbitration is when the multiple uh, microprocessors share a bus, um, sometimes called a uh, network. The arbitration typically built into bus protocol because it has to handle if more than one parties try to send data at the same time, how do you decide which one to get served first, which one to get used the bus first? There's different kinds of uh, back-off schemes randomly or using some type of code so that uh, they will wait for some time before they retry sending the data. Uh, this one is a uh, Interrupt, vector interrupt table. Um, this is one of one example of actual DMA controller. Okay. Um, this is a, as we said, a standalone, sp single purpose processor. Um, it has many control signals. It also has address bus and data bus. This is another example. Uh, this is a programmable priority controller. Multi-level multi bus architecture. In modern computer systems, uh, you have a lot of components. Uh, besides microprocessors, uh, memory, uh, memory systems. You have many, many different kinds of I.O. devices, we call peripherals. In a modern computer system, we typically use multi-level bus to connect them. For components that are operating at very high frequency, uh, for example, microprocessor, cache, memory, DMA controller. These are connected to processor local bus or system bus, sometimes called, um, or in x86 architecture, it's called front side bus. So that's this bus with very high operating speed. Um, this bus is useful for, or it's critical for the system performance because everything from the um, program execution to system control are happening on this bus. There are some lower speed buses, for example, uh, PCIe bus, um, I2, I2C or uh, some other peripheral buses. Uh, they take separate levels. In this example, we have the processor local bus, which is the high speed one, and we have a peripheral bus. In order for the components to communicate, the system 
leverage these called bridge chips to connect different buses together. And these bridge chips will be responsible for the address translation. Um, program use control registers to do uh, address mapping, etc. For communication, um, in modern computing communication uh, systems or buses, um, Layering is an uh, important strategy. Layering is to break the complexity of the communication protocols into different pieces. And each piece is simpler and is easier to maintain, um, is easier to interface. One good example is the network communication. Um, you now have your Wi-Fi in every laptop um, some laptops still have this wired gigabit connection um, and you can run your um, Internet Explorer or Firefox browser on your computer, right? In, in fact, what's happening here is many different communication layers. The bottom layer we call physical layer, um, either wired or wireless. And then we have the so-called data link layer and then the IP layer, and TCP, and HTTP. So these different um, protocols uh, are maintained separately, uh, and they can uh, be replaced with uh, equivalent protocols at the same layer. So this layer design is very um, typical in modern communication protocols. In the next couple of slides, we're gonna look at uh, parallel communication, serial communication, and wireless communication very brief, briefly. For parallel communication, the concept is that you have multiple data control and possibly power wires. Um, and you can transfer one bit per wire, and since you have multiple wires, um, you can transfer uh, many bits at the same time. It supports high data throughput uh, with short distance. It typically used when connecting devices on the same IC or same circuit board. Um, the bus has to be short because uh, high, uh, longer wires will introduce higher capacitance, which will require more time to charge or discharge. Also, the data misalignment may happen when you have longer wires. Uh, the downside is that it's costly compared to serial communication. Uh, the um, wires are bulky. On the other hand, you can do serial communication. In this case, you only have one data wire, single data wire, and possibly uh, some control wires. You know computers operate minimal uh, on the word, um, so this word, I mean, byte, this byte is 8-bit. In order for it to communicate through the serial uh, line, you have to do bit shifting. So you will transmit one bit at a time. And on the other hand, it will assemble the received bit so that you present to the other um, processor as a byte. Uh, it's cheaper, um, but it has more uh, complex interfacing logic because you have to um, really make sure that the communication two parties can understand the bit streams um, on the single wire, uh, where is the start of the byte, where is the end of the byte, um, and how do we do error checking, etc. Wireless communication, there are uh, many different standards, uh, infrared, radio frequency, uh, for example, uh, ZigBee uh, is one of the uh, very typical uh, RF communication protocols for, um, not, uh, for short range wireless communication uh, for embedded devices. 
error detection and correction, uh, every protocol has to uh, include the ways to do this error checking and detection. Uh, parity check is uh, widely used. Uh, odd parity is when the number of ones is odd number. Uh, even parity is the other. Also, check sums are used to uh, check whether there's um, any error happened during the communication. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this serial protocol I square C. I square C stands for inter IC. It's a two wired serial bus protocol developed by Philips um, Semiconductors about 20 years ago. There are different generations of I square C. Uh, the new uh, standard can communicate at the rate of uh, over 3.4 megabits per second with 10 bit addressing in fast mode. Uh, when I talk about memory subsystem uh, last week, I showed you an example where we have two WE prompt chips and we connect those two WE prompt chips onto this I square C bus. So we have a data line, we have a clock, and we use a specific protocol to select one of these chips and to address these chips to do read and write operation. Uh, not only WE prompts, other flash memory, uh, real time clocks, and watchdog timer, and some microcontrollers, uh, they all support I square C uh, serial communication protocol. Uh, as part of the first lab, uh, you're given the RTC uh, clock chip, a little kit, and that has the I square C uh, connectors. And we expect you to uh, connect to the microcontroller. Uh, using this I square C communication protocol. This is the structure. We have two wires, clock and data, and you can connect many different uh, ICs onto this bus. Microcontroller, WE prompt, sensor, controller, etc. There are essentially four uh, different bits you can transfer on this bus, on this zero bus. Start, stop, zero to one. Okay. And these bits are generated by using these clock signals and combination with the data signal. So if you have a high retain on a clock signal and you have a, a lowering edge on the data clock, on the data wire, and that's a start bit. <laughs> on the other hand, if you have a rising edge, that's a stop bit when the clock is high. The actual data bits is happening when you maintain the data line to low and you have a pulse on the clock um, wire. If you are setting a one, you do the opposite on data wire. So, what we see on these two wires are going to be some combination of start bit, ones or zeros, and then stop bit, etc. Now, there are a lot of details. On this protocol, I would encourage you to look at a, the I square C section of the PIC microcontroller. It shows you in detail how you should control the how you should manipulate the control registers of I square C to generate these uh, control bits, and also how to choose the clock frequency, etc. For the RTC part, you need to look at the RTC uh, data sheet to understand how do you assign address and uh, what will be the address to use in order to access the um, hour, minute, second field from the RTC unit. Okay, I'm going to skip this.
I just skipped a few um, slides about different um, communication protocols. You could take a look at those after class. What we covered in this lecture is uh, the basic protocol concepts, the actors, directions, uh, multiplexing control methods. And we look at general purpose microprocessors uh, in terms of the port based IO, bus based IO, uh, IO addressing methods, interrupt hand handling, and direct memory access. We talked briefly about uh, priority arbitration and we uh, introduced the bus hierarchy. Uh, and then finally, we uh, looked into advanced communication protocols with example of parallel, zero, uh, I squared C, et cetera.